Educationalists believe a child's character is formed in the crucial years from two to five. There are about 600 recognized nursery schools in Britain, some run by local authorities, some independently. But there are still far too few of them. From the outset, the idea was that by giving young children the chance to play together, they would develop more fully. At the Elizabeth Lansbury Nursery School at Poplar, London, music periods are a little more organised. mothers banded together in 1961 to form an association to encourage the setting up of local playgroups. Today it has more than 300 members. Small groups of children aged from two and a half to five play together at regular morning or afternoon sessions in the houses of mothers, some of whom have had some training before they married. Finger painting here is not so much to develop the future artist as to give an opportunity for self-expression. This school runs a part-time system with one group of children in the morning and a different group in the afternoon. In fact, two schools in one. This is not only to help with the nursery school shortage, but because some children are happier at home for half the day. The Nature Corner teaches little boys to be gentle with such delicate things as stick insects. Even learning to blow your nose can be fun with a coloured paper handkerchief. Entrance to comprehensive schools is not based on the result of an 11 plus examination. Children of all abilities are admitted from the dullest to the brightest. The size of the schools enables them to employ many specialized teachers and most comprehensives offer courses that otherwise would not be possible outside of a technical college. Boys are able to study draftsmanship, architecture, surveying and even boat building. Teachers like, too, the opportunities given them to try out their own ideas. Take, for example, the mathematics laboratory at Wandsworth. Exercise book sums are replaced by practical experiments. By seeing and feeling the shape and nature of mathematical figures, the child rapidly grasps the principles of algebra and geometry. There are many schools of thought on the subject of comprehensives. They've been going for about 10 years, and an official survey is now being made of how the system is working. Comprehensives cater for children of every kind of ability from all kinds of backgrounds and are essentially large communities, sometimes numbering about 2,000. This doesn't mean that the clever ones are held back or the not-so-bright neglected. The children are soon sorted into tuition groups suited to their abilities. And there are many instances of the tortoise overtaking the hare.
At this comprehensive school at Holland Park in London, there are 2,000 pupils, nearly half of them girls. Girls are at least a match for boys at school, and in some things, they're a good deal better. At this school, all the girls learn housecraft. This is a subject they can take in their GCE exams, the General Certificate of Education. The girls prepare a meal in the model kitchen, lay the table in the model flat, and then invite a member of the staff for lunch. Today, they've asked the headmaster. Entertaining in their own homes will hold no terrors for these girls, and cooking for a husband and family will be like, well, like being back at school. Sewing classes are naturally very popular. These girls are making summer dresses for themselves, or maybe something special for the school dance. It's not surprising that many firms are anxious to employ girls like these as home service advisors as soon as they leave school, and some will themselves become teachers. Education these days covers a lot more ground than the three R's. All the boys at this school pass through the workshops, and this decides many of them on careers as craftsmen, technicians, or technologists. At careers conventions such as this at Kidbrook, children and their parents can meet and talk to representatives of various industries and professions. They can see some of the equipment used and processes employed. They are free to ask as many questions as they like and the answers may help them in a choice of career. In Britain today, taxpayers and ratepayers contribute about £890 million a year to educate 7 million school children. Yet, more and more parents are also paying to send their sons to one of 90 independent public schools. Schools such as Eton, which is the largest. Parents stint themselves to raise the 2,000 to 4,000 pounds which a public school education costs. Many now save the fees through insurance policies. Today, less than 10% of the boys of Eton come from Britain's old aristocracy. The running of Eton is largely the responsibility of the senior boys. In each house, there's a body of them called the library, which is self-elected. The captain of the house is appointed by the house tutor. Communications to organize life depend on fags. The library also controls discipline. Young offenders are punished for being noisy or dirty or rude. The captain may punish by beating, but only with his tutor's consent. Most children's homes are not in new buildings, but they've brightened a lot of them up inside. None of the old brown and dark green paint that I knew 30 years ago. What matters much more is the greater understanding and love the children get today. In the 17 years I lived in children's homes, I don't remember any real understanding and very little warmth or affection. There are more than 2,200 children's homes in Britain, and they are homes not orphanages or foundling institutions. 500 of them are run by voluntary societies. This new one at Canterbury is one of Dr. Bernardo's 110 homes which cater for 2,500 children. Like most of the other homes, it's got a homely atmosphere. The nearest we ever got to a playroom was a room with wooden chairs and a few lockers. Much more thought is given to children's interests today. Look at this model railway. How many children living with their families could have one like this? 
Mind you, the boys in this home helped to build it over 15 years. Stand by, studio. On mic. This is Crown Woods broadcasting on Channel 3. It's just after 3.41, and at a quarter to four, you can hear the 10th edition of Crown Week. Until then, some music. <laughs> children produce a weekly magazine program which they prepare, write and transmit themselves. The show is heard over the school's loudspeaker system and the rest of the pupils listen in. They later discuss and criticize what they've heard and they don't pull any punches. All the activities you expect to see in school are augmented with others that are much rarer. Closed circuit television for instance. This large county secondary school in Surrey is one of a number which are trying out teaching machines. They use them with large groups of children working through a whole lesson period, such as in this mathematics class, or sometimes for individual children working on their own, either to catch up the others or forge ahead. Pupils load their own machines and use them at their own rate. Sometimes, they also use calculating machines in conjunction with teaching machines. This machine uses sound as well as vision to teach, and a dial replaces the push-button operation. The programs in this machine are on what is called a branching system. If the student gives the wrong answer, she's sent back to study and try again. Here, in the grounds of Loughborough Training College, is another collection of teaching machines, this time in a travelling classroom. This caravan goes round to schools all over Leicestershire. These are two of the early models. Today, many work on a press button system. Teaching aids being tried out at Loughborough include coloured movies which lead on to practical experiments. The children watch this film about air, one of a series, as often as they like. the only school in Britain to be fully equipped with a multitude of TV and radio sets, record players, film, film strip and slide projectors, tape recorders and language machines. All part of an experiment christened by the children themselves, an adventure into learning. This is a new and noisy world. The children run their own library of 1,500 films and film strips. However, the usage of the ordinary book library has increased greatly since the school became automated. The children learn to look after the equipment and to understand how it works. Indeed, they claim to do less damage than the staff. The ordinary classroom, however modern, will have to be redesigned as these learning methods spread. When there's a really important story to invent, Chaps need a bit of privacy. One day, Russell and I went to bed. We were reading the paper. We were just about to turn to the back when we saw an exciting bit in the front. It said the highwayman, a reward of him to be captured, a thousand pounds. I, I only thought that they were in fairy stories. I didn't even think they'd lived. Normal kids? No different from any others, except that in the two years the experiment has been running, children of 10 and 11 have acquired vocabularies of boys and girls of 14 and 15. 
It may be a while before the state can afford to equip every school like this, but that it is going to happen, few doubt. Initially, some of the Oxywood teachers had their doubts, but they are now fully enthusiastic, find, together with the children, that learning is indeed an adventure when you can bring the whole world into the classroom. Outdoor work begins on a playground map, which includes models of places of interest, towns and rivers. The next stage is to get the class out to sea for themselves. They may spend a day cruising on a river to study the waterway and how it's used, why locks are necessary and local river history. All of this will later be written up in the classroom. On foot, another class follows a river to its source, where different types of rock are found and examined, not just talked about in a geography classroom. Mathematics comes into outdoor studies when the rate of flow of the river is worked out. Chips of wood are dropped from a bridge and timed over a given distance as the current carries them along. More than 800 secondary school children from Surrey leave their classrooms for a 14-day outdoor study trip of a kind which is becoming more popular even than the summer holiday. They travel across the continent for a Mediterranean cruise in one of two school ships run by a British company. More than 30,000 British school children sail in these ships for educational cruises which range from Russia to North Africa. Dormitories, sleeping up to 40 children, are allocated to each school. And as well as the ship's five matrons to look after the girls, there's one teacher with every 15 children. For the eight days that the ship was at sea, these school children had five lessons, each of 45 minutes every day. As they were cruising in Greek waters, all the lessons dealt with some aspect of Greece and its contribution to world history. But there's still left time to lounge on deck and enjoy the sun. No public funds are being contributed to these trips, but the Ministry of Education and many county authorities are encouraging the idea of taking children out to sea for themselves. And so it's back home again by train. Loaded down with presents and souvenirs for the family, excited and anxious to get to school again to tell the others all about their adventures. Not so many years ago, London and the great cities of Britain were pockmarked with bomb sites. Sometimes they've been cleared and turned into playgrounds or elegant gardens. Among other things, a sport grew out of them, the racing game of Cycle Speedway, a game born in the bricks and rubble of the air raids, a sport for youngsters who were spending nights in the shelters. The first Speedway cycle tracks, 90 yards round, were marked out by the boys and girls of the bomb streets using shattered bricks to mark the course. Those were tough days, and they invented a tough little sport to go with them. And Cycle Speedway, which is now organized and has its leagues, can probably claim to be the only sport today to have originated in the crackle of ak-ak fire. Any old dressing up made a change from the world of ration cards and air raid warnings, and any old bike would do. And the game caught on in amazing fashion in the east end of London, in Coventry, and up north. The track was usually a shambles, rough and ready. But some of the lads remember the Speedway stars who'd been their idols in pre-war days and tried to copy the dirt track technique. The 
the first move to give town children space in which it was safe to play was the play street, from which through traffic was banned. Today, parked cars often reduce the play space drastically and can often be dangerous. The old-fashioned playground with not much more than swings and roundabouts doesn't exactly fire the imagination of children in the jet age. Neither is this sort of thing much more exciting. But the London Borough of Camden thought up a new idea. With the emphasis on a miniature road system, on which the children can ride on bicycles and in toy cars supplied by the centre, the site was deliberately chosen to be in the middle of the large Regent's Park Council estate in the area. But, despite the fascination of traffic lights that really work, many children wanted to build their own world of make-believe. So, very soon, scope for adventure was also provided. The idea of this kind of playground, which is open throughout the year, is that anything goes, within reason of course, and that the children have the scope and the materials to give full rein to their imagination. Wonderful what you can do with a lot of old timber. These children are members of a club which meets twice a week during the school holidays at the Centre for Spastic Children in London's Cheney Walk. There is never a lack of helpers to fetch the children from their homes all over London and to help them enjoy themselves and make friends. Many of the voluntary helpers are sixth form boys and girls from local schools. Adventure is the keynote of boys' club life today, and there are 200,000 boys between 14 and 18 who are finding it with the help of the National Association of Boys' Clubs. A club is a boys' springboard to weekend or holiday expeditions at home and abroad. At Conway, they're converting a tumble-down cottage into an adventure base where they can eat and sleep, plan their expeditions and get a shower. Yes, these boys are tough, all right. The one attraction boys don't join clubs for is girls. In fact, many boys look upon their club as somewhere to get away from them. Most boys' committees exclude girls, except as canteen helpers, football supporters, or guests on dance nights. Yes, a boys' club is one of the few male preserves left in Britain today. But for how much longer? Some of the local authorities which help to pay for new clubs and their leaders want the boys to let the girls in. But is this really a girls' world? Judo, one of 22 sports and games that the young can choose as they go from bronze to silver to the gold award. Many fall out, pressure of exams, the new job, but even a few weeks spent in the scheme means some broadening of experience. 